right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to raise the awareness of trauma and to support and inspire new trauma therapists just starting out on the trauma-informed journey. I do that with my membership community, Trauma Therapist 2.0, my online courses and workshops, and the Trauma Therapist newsletter. If you're a therapist of any kind and you work with individuals who've been impacted by trauma, I invite you to head on over to my website at thetraumatherapistproject.com. That's the thetraumatherapistproject.com. All right, let's get started. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Sylvia Dudkevich. Sylvia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. So Sylvia is... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Got an Oreo stuck in my throat. Um, Sylvia is the Critical Therapy Institute founder and president. With more than 20 years of experience in social services and a passion for psychotherapy, Sylvia created CTI when she perceived the need to expand psychoanalytic praxis to reflect how race, class, gender, and religion intersect with psychological conflict. Sylvia has an intense background in psycho psychoanalytic theory and trauma with a particular focus on torture. However, after seeing that traditional psychoanalysis was not able to adequately transform and heal her patients, she embarked on an extended period of research and training. Drawing on liberation psychology and critical pedagogy scholarship and combining them with her real life experience as a practicing psychotherapist, she founded CTI in 2012. Woo! It's so, a lot. It's a lot. And it's an intense background. But before we get there, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Oh, that's interesting. I am from Romania. I was born there and lived there until I was about 13 years old. I came here as a refugee. It was back then it was communism under Ceausescu. Um, and currently I'm in Jackson Heights, New York. Okay, awesome. The long journey from oh. you know Romania to New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, all right, let's. How did you get into this field? Um, I got in initially. I never thought I was going to be a therapist. Um, I was involved in pol politics, Romanian politics. I wanted to be a journalist at some point, which I think has taught me how to ask questions. Um, then I got into religious studies and psychoanalysis in particular in particular for me through religion and an analysis of religion through that lens was very um enlightening and I loved it and I never thought I could be a therapist because I didn't think I had the patience um interestingly enough I went to therapy and uh while I was in therapy I talked about how I don't have the patience to do therapy and my therapist was like well you have patience enough to be here and you're doing the work. So maybe it's something you should consider. Uh, how um, old were you at this point? Oh, I was in my twenties. Okay. Um, and then I s went for a master's in psychology. I started training at different institutes and went back to school for social work because I had a very, I was very passionate about social justice um, and then slowly but surely, I became a therapist and I worked in a lot of social service agencies. Mm -hmm. um, I got burned out like all of us because they're not sustainable um, for having a work-life balance. And then I was also, I wanted to create something different. So I created critical therapy and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that I came from a brutal dictatorship. And that part of the theory that I sort of um, created with the help of my patients obviously incorporates the political and how the political affects us and impacts us in a very real way. So you you were uh, you grew up in that type of environment in that in not type that was the environment a brutal yes. dictatorship as you said I mean that's hardcore I mean that's something that we here in the West in the United States, certainly don't, can't even conceive of, I think. Um, and, and honestly, I, I remember, I didn't conceive, I mean, I knew about it, but, you know, theoretically, I didn't know what that meant experientially until I remember I did a training at NYU Bellevue Survivors of Torture. And they talked about, you know, part of the exercise was 
imagine you live in a country and at any moment the government could come and arrest you. How would that feel for you? And how do you think, what do you think would be the impact to understand some of the survivors of torture and, and some of survivors of brutal dictatorships? And to me it was, well, so visceral, like, well, of course, you know, you know what to do. And that's when I realized what has, what I've survived and the impact it had on me and probably still has on me to some extent. You you talked about, you know, initially uh, never thinking that you'd be a therapist because <clears throat> you, you didn't have the patience, but what, what was it uh, initially that even lit that flame for you? Um, I think it was my passion for the theory, in particular about psychoanalysis. It was also my own therapy that I, to this day, say saved my life. And I think I wouldn't be the person that I am today if I didn't embark on that journey. Um, and then sort of through the training, I found my calling. I, I say this often. Um, I don't feel like I'm going to work when I work with patients. I feel that it's such a privileged place to be in and to see how people transform their lives and to take a journey that's so intimate and so transformational. Um, it's it's awesome work. So I love it. And, and I wish I knew how to tell people to find their passion so they go to work and don't feel like they're working. I don't. I sort of just got into it. You mm -hmm. know? And why? what about psychoanal psychoanalysts in particular? I like um, the fact that most of our decisions are unconscious and the the guidance of our subconscious. I like Freud's. I know Freud is, you know, I, I'm well aware has its his um, problems, but he um, his initial work was with trauma survivors, right? Mm -hmm. His initial work was with women who were sexually abused. Um, and he discovered a way that by talking about it and by sort of having witnesses to your life and processing what happens to you, you can heal. And of course, the, the schools of psychoanalysis have been, you know, sort of changed. And we went from a purely psychoanalytic school to a more um, interpersonal dynamic and so forth. But there is something about talk therapy. There is something about sitting in a room with someone and telling your story that is powerful and transformational. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's kind of talk about how uh, CTI, Critical Theory Institute, Critical Therapy Institute, uh, came to be. It came to be through the work that I did with uh, my patients at social service agencies, particularly domestic violence agencies. So um, a little bit of background, as you mentioned, my interest was to work with um, torture survivors, pe people escaping political turmoil and so forth. And I got into that work and did some of it. And then I realized that the most painful stories, the most traumatic stories, the, more, the most people who are tortured are women in their homes. And it's something we don't talk about. Right. And it's something that is so much more difficult to get over because the people who are supposed to love and protect you are the people who are inflicting the pain. Mm -hmm. So I switched and my specialties became working with trauma survivors, particularly domestic violence survivors, childhood sexual abuse survivors. Um, and in working and because of that, I ended up working in different social service agencies. At some point, I, ra I ran domestic violence shelters. Um, and it was there through the counseling that we were doing with these women that I realized that we were lacking a deep analysis of power as it happens in the personal relationship you have with your therapist, but also your power as a patient in society and also your power as a therapist in society and how those things interact in the clinical hour. Um, so I I, I, I've noticed how you had women who were abused, who were beaten by their partners, and then they would do the same things to their children. Um, and empowerment meant I have power over you rather than I need to learn how to share power or I have a responsibility towards you. So that was the biggest change that I think needed to happen in, in psychotherapy is for people to learn how to talk about power 
to analyze power dynamics. Um, and then slowly, because I was also working with mostly poor women and um, talk, you know, I began, began thinking about how issues such as race, class and gender impact and affect mental health in a very real way. Um, and the last part is the um, critical thinking. I think part of therapy should not last a lifetime. That was my pet peeve about psychoanalysis, right? It never really ends. And of course, the work of the, the intra-psychic work and the work of critically looking at your life should never end, but you don't need to go to therapy to do that. Right. I think, you know, one of my patients said this a long time ago, and I loved it, that she, she thought of therapy as a place where you go and you sort of analyze your life, and then you get the tools to be able to do that on your own. Mm -hmm. Let me um, let me ask you interrupt here for a second. So, you know, we're, we you're talking about an interest in uh, working with people who've been traumatized, who've been tortured, and then domestic violence. Um, but Sylvia, what is it? I mean, yes, I know, and I'm, I can hear the the question being answered. But what is it about you specifically that drove you to do that work? I was very dissatisfied. The work of critical therapy or the work of therapy? The work of working with trauma and torture and domestic violence specifically. Um, I think it was part of, obviously, the personal is political and um, borrowing from psychoanalysis on some conscious or maybe subconscious way, dealing with my own issues of having have, have having had left my country at the moment when I left you know Romania I was 13 years old uh my mom came here and then we came my dad and I came but I never thought I would see any of my friends any of my relatives it was you left and that was it it was a obviously a trauma mm -hmm. um also we lived in a country where you know when my mom came and she wanted to ask for political asylum she couldn't say goodbye to me because if she did and i would have gone to school for example and said well my mom plans to go to the united states my parents would have gotten arrested after my mom left the secret police came to our house and interrogated my dad for two days um mm -hmm. they also interrogated me and asked a couple of questions all those things i think made me the person that i am today and made me really passionate about how political institutions can hurt us in very real ways and the impact it has on our mental health. And especially right now in the U.S., if we look at what is happening, there is a sort of far right movement. Talk about, you know, bodily control over women's bodies that are that are happening that people dismiss thinking it's not a big deal or it can't really happen here, but it could happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. well, and, and it is happening here. Yeah. Um, OK. You talked about power, uh, the exploration of power, both with the, the therapist and the, the client or patient. What does that look like in session when you're working with someone? Um, so we actually have a three stage process through critical therapy and the stages are not, are not necessarily chronological like year one it looks like this but more or less so the first stage of critical therapy borrowing from psychoanalysis a we meaning the therapist takes on a position of power right we are the subject supposed to know from Lacan right we are the person who the patient invests the notion that we have control in the session and we do we reveal very little about ourselves we are present um, but we are not very interpersonal. Um, and the reason for that is I believe strongly that in order for transference to happen, there needs to be a power over and there needs to be a very little revelation or very little uh, self-disclosure on the part of on the part of the therapist. Um, and then slowly, as we move towards analyzing and realizing a person's defenses and what brought them to who they are today, the therapist sort of tries to give away some of that power. And it's really important, especially for people who have been marginalized, to assert that power, to assert themselves, to be able to, you know, get to a place where they make more demands, where they learn how to share power with another. And through that process, slowly, as, as we move to a more interpersonal dynamic, we end up to what Paulo Freire talked about, 
two people who meet to dialogue or talk about the world. So it's two individuals who are now collaborative, who know that the therapist is an expert in asking questions and me as a patient, I'm the expert in my life. Um, and it's a process. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I've been, you know, I, I was teaching a class last night and I was talking about this. Um, I wonder if we didn't live in a capitalist power over society, if critical therapy would look the same, if we needed that first stage where we assert themselves, ourselves as therapists, where we have power over our patients in order to mimic, you know, societal interactions or parental interactions that exist today. I don't know if, if we were more collaborative as a society, maybe we didn't need that, but unfortunately we're not there. So obviously that's uh, taking a lot from the psychoanalytic model. Yes. But so a couple of questions here. Um, I mean, inherently within the therapist client duality, there is a power structure, a power dynamic. So you're, you're saying that over and above that, there are certain ways, things that uh, the therapist does from your perspective to what? Uh... To Well, I think it's also naming. It's one of the things that happens, you're correct. The therapist will always have some sort of power over our patients because of the nature of the relationship. But the truth is there's power in every relationship. And we sometimes have power over the people we love and sometimes they have power over us. We just don't name it. I also think as a society, we have been taught to think of power as something negative. And we use it in a negative way. It's always power over. It's We don't have good examples of power with, of sharing power, and of being collaborative. So one of the goal of critical therapy, ultimately, is for people to learn how to share power with another, how to acknowledge their own power, how to acknowledge their own powerlessness. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about intersectionality and the way our identities show up in the clinical hour, we name that in a very real way. We discuss it. We talk about how that impacts how we see the world and how that impacts the clinical hour together and how we negotiate our, what we have we learned about power in our lives through our histories. So, uh, and additionally, within the context of someone who's experienced uh, trauma, uh, torture, domestic violence, the power becomes even magnified or lack thereof become magnified. So how is that being uh, brought out or explored with the client, say? Yeah, I think especially if you've survived domestic violence and, and all types of interpersonal traumas, power is so charged mm -hmm. and you know a model of relationships of either I am a victim or I'm an abuser. And those are impossible choices because they're both very harmful. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to investigate how power can look differently in relationships, how we, you know, we for example, you mentioned we as therapists have power over our patients. Yes, and they have power over us. They pay for therapy, which is our income and livelihood. They How they show up is important. And we talk about all these things um, very openly. And we try to practice a different type of relationship. Almost what we say is we offer a blueprint mm -hmm. for a relationship that's more... Um, I don't think egal egalitarian, but as I say, power shifts. It's never like we're never equal and learning to accept that and learning to accept that there's nothing inherently wrong in having power is what you do with it that matters, I believe, is essential, especially to trauma survivors. So give me give us an example of how you might work with a client to explore their power or lack thereof. And the, the 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 role of power within domestic violence um so i you know we the role of power in domestic violence is is about patriarchy unfortunately it's about the world we live in where people exert power over other people because they can and usually they exert power over those who are less equal than them um and that's a problem i think we need to do a better um job at educating people around how you show up in relationships and that thoughts can never be wrong, but what you do with those thoughts can be very mm -hmm. wrong. Um, so when, you know, when our 
I remember when one of my patients, when I used to work at a domestic violence agency came in and she was in a lot, she's done a lot of therapy and she was in an abusive relationship. And we started talking about her agency, right? One of the things we tend to do to victims in an, in an attempt to protect them is one, we don't give them agency. We want to save them rather than work with them to save themselves, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and this is about empowerment. We don't empower people. People empower themselves. And we say that, but as therapists, we don't actually practice mm-hmm. that, which is to really question what is, this is a dynamic. You are in this abusive relationship. What has brought you to this place? Now, that's not blaming the victim, and you could do it. And if you're a good therapist, you could ask questions in a way that is very clarifying that I'm not blaming you while you're here. But what mm-hmm. is what has happened that brought you to this place? What are your choices? Also, what are your lack of choices? If you don't have, let's say you're undocumented and you're married to someone who's giving you papers, let's mm-hmm. say you're not, you don't have money, and how those systems interact with your power and agency. And ultimately, what are the different choices you can make? And one of the things she said about the sessions is it it was the first time that she went to therapy that someone asked her, what was your role in this? Like, rather than, oh, you're a victim, let me save you. This Mm -hmm. is what you need to do. You're considering coming into the shelter. I got you, you know, and and that's that's repeating the same model. Right. I have power over you. Now, I'm not abusing you, but I'm still doing it for you. I'm not giving you the agency and, and the belief that you can do it. Right. Right. And right. The, the second thing about specifically with with victims is that we tend to create perfect victims mm-hmm. because, you know, sort of like it, we need to save them. They're perfect. And what I say, what I used to say to people who were working as counselors in our shelters, especially is our clients are not perfect. They're human. Um, and, and it's important to see that humanity, not to idealize victimhood, like, well, you're a victim, you've been through so much, you must be perfect, but you're messy. And that's, that's part of the, the greatness of, of being alive. I I know I always think it's dangerous to generalize when we're talking about trauma and and people in general but are there commonalities given given this uh presence of power and lack thereof within the context of with the subject of domestic violence are there commonalities in people who become victimized Yes, and I agree with you. I hate when people generalize things. One of my pet peeves these days is how I do have an Instagram account, but I see how all these people are on Instagram giving advice what people should be doing without a context of what that person's history, which is so particular um, and so important. Um, I think the commonalities are people who are traumatized come from um, families that exert power over them. It's usually if you have had domestic violence in your own family, you're more likely to end up in a in a situation that's similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's in an attempt to save or your parents, maybe uh, that you repeat the same situations, believing that there's nothing better. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe you're trying to work something through. I also want to say that the person is always political, meaning that sometimes it's just a lack of resources. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're, you know, living in poverty, it's much more difficult to have different choices and to be able to leave a relationship that is dysfunctional and that could become, you know, abusive. Um, so I think it's important not to generalize, but at the same time, I think as survivors, for example, we know that if you have been sexually abused, you're more likely to abuse someone. That doesn't make you a monster. It makes you someone who is trying to work through something that you haven't mastered or understood. Owning up to that possibility, I think, is where the change happens. It's not denying the fact that I lived through something and maybe now I have these urges and I don't understand them. And I think it's important to go to therapy and talk about them. I also think it's important that therapists are able to hold that space. I've seen, and not panic. Mm -hmm. Just because someone has thoughts like, well, I really want to beat my child doesn't mean they're going to do it. The fact that they're talking to you about what they would like to do, they're probably not doing it. So I think we need to teach clinicians in particular how to have these difficult conversations and how to 
be able to talk about these things and also hold your patients accountable. Because what we do, whether you've been traumatized or not, you're still responsible for your actions. I just want to remind everyone that I'm speaking with Sylvia Dukevich. Um, her website is criticaltherapy.org. Sylvia, as we kind of wind down here, I really love you. I want to invite you to share with us an early clinical error. Oh, I early, I make them sometimes <laughs> even now. I mean, I think, and I want to say that to clinicians, if you think you're not making mistakes, you're missing the point. Um, and I, I think mistakes are important. I think sometimes mistakes could show, if you own up to them, especially with your patients, could show your own humanity. And the fact that, talk about power, right? The fact that we're in this together and and especially for people who have been traumatized who don't know and haven't seen models of people in power coming back and saying, you know, I think I missed this or I'm sorry if this came, you know, in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of my biggest mistakes that has changed the way that I practice was I've learned this lesson from one of my patients who was a domestic violence survivor. And I am actually writing a paper on this now. Um, she would come into therapy and we worked together for a couple of years and she would say, I love you. I would say, I deeply care about you. You know, the standard therapist uh, um, sort of response. And then slowly she kept asking and then one day she said, how come you don't ever say it? So I went home, I thought about it. I was like, oh my God, this is such a great question. And of course you're you're not supposed to say it. I mean, there are some rules around that in some sense. What if they misunderstand this? Oh my God, what do I do with this? Um, and I sat and I investigated this. And with time, I, I thought about there has to be a better way. And there has to be a way that we could tell our patients that we love them without the fear that they'll misrepresent that. So I did, I, you know, I read a lot of articles and sat with all. So, you know, after a couple of weeks, I went back and I said, I'm going to do it. Um, and I told her I loved her. Um, and I thought I did a brilliant job. I was like, oh, so <laughs> um, and then years later, when she finished therapy, I asked her if she would like to be interviewed about the process. I said, I want to write a paper about this love thing. And I would like for if you want to contribute and she wanted to. Um, so I did a, a couple of interviews about the process of how that was, what was right, what was wrong. And we came back to the moment when I told her I loved her. And she said, your timing was perfect. Your delivery was horrible. And she said, you were so anxious. And this is why our patients always know what's happening. That you said, I love you. And she goes, normally when you say something, you'd be like, and how does that feel for you? Or what does that mean to you? But this time you were like, and this is what it means. One, two, three, four. Because I was so anxious about, I don't want you to misrepresent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was very enlightening and, and it was so helpful to realize I need to get more comfortable to sit in that feeling. She also said it was so important because she came from an ultra Hasidic uh, background. So her parents were not very affectionate and didn't tell her, I love you. And, and she unfortunately equated love with sexuality. So we had to work through it. This is why the timing was great because at the time that I was able to say it. She knew what I meant. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I love you. I like you. Let's get together. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, and she said, it was so important. You meant so much to me. It was so important to be able to hear those words. And as a result, now I practice that. And I think it's really important that we're able to set boundaries and also tell our patients that we share a very intimate and special relationship with them. That's awesome. Wow. Sylvia, I'd love to have you back. You are so passionate about what you do. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. How can people best reach you? Um, so if you go to our website, uh, criticaltherapy.org, there is a link to a Instagram account, which is my account. The reason that is so is because my last name, as you painfully are aware, is very difficult. So we figured this is the easiest way to get in touch personally with me. Um, also, you could visit our website, see our services and our other wonderful clinicians and my 
book just came out. Please buy it. And um, I look forward to comments. I always want to be challenged and I always want to grow. You know, I, I think when you stop listening to people's comments, you stop growing. So let's, I want to get the, the name of the book here, uh, Critical Therapy, Power and Liberation in Psychotherapy. Um, we'll have that. It's a up. very short book. It's very easy to read. We, that, we did that on purpose. We wanted to sort of do a brief introduction and to make it very accessible to folks. Okay. We'll have that linked up at the show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. Uh, Sylvia, awesome. Again, love to have you back. Uh, appreciate you joining me today. Thank Take you care. so much. I really enjoyed this. Thanks All so right. much for your questions. I want to thank you so much for listening to this podcast and I want to let you know that I am very excited about my new podcast, The Right Now Project. The Right Now Project is about healing. It's about stepping into our own courage and authenticity and getting started or continuing along our healing process. We're all going through something, whatever it is, in this crazy life we're living. And The Right Now Project is about honoring that, celebrating that, and sharing our stories via the associated membership site. Check us out at therightnowproject.com, therightnowproject.com.